Okay, hello and welcome everyone. I'm glad that you can join us today. We're gonna to be talking about undergraduate research opportunities and we're gonna talk a little bit from the perspective of Carnegie Mellon University within the Summer Scholar Program. So I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share the importance and impact of undergraduate research and also to um, allow you to hear directly from some of our scholars. And today is special because we'll be hearing from scholars from Germany and they can expose you to some of the German uh, um, um, institutional opportunities and then the differences of coming here and how having some global research experience can really help to you to understand what pathways might be available to you and how to go forward. Science and technology is really a global endeavor. So building early um, international and global partnerships is essential. Here's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about the Summer Scholar Program. We're gonna hear directly from scholars about their research, some of their experiences, and how to apply, not just to risk, but really to encourage you to think about what are your next steps in getting to undergraduate research and why should you even consider that? So i um, happy to dive in. My name is Rachel Burson. I serve as the Global Programs Manager at the Robotics Institute and co-director of the RI Summer Scholars Program. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to invite each one of our scholars to introduce themselves um, to you and then we'll dive in to learn more about the uh, program at Carnegie Mellon and some other opportunities that you might pursue. Jan, would you like to introduce yourself? All right, yes, I'm uh, Jan Malte. I'm a uh, student from Germany, uh, University of Bielefeld. I'm still currently doing my bachelor's um, part of my studies, I, uh, but I'm in my final year. And I was in uh, taking part in RIS uh, last summer, um, also through the help of the DAD, but I'm going to say more about that later. Thank you. Jana? Hi, my name is Jana. I study computer science at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and I was also part of the RIS 2022 cohort last summer, um, also thanks to the DAD, and I worked on computer vision over the summer. And lastly, it's me. Hi, I'm Tim Sturm. I'm a, a computer science student at the University. University of Paderborn, <laughs> and um, I also had the pleasure of being part of the RISC 2020 cohort, uh, 2022 cohort this year. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. So to help you get really anchored um, in thinking about robotics and thinking about the opportunities here, um, one of the things that I'd like to share with you before we begin is that um, graduate school in today's global um, technology um, environment, whether that be in academia or industry, um, really building your pathways to graduate school and having strong graduate opportunities and research opportunities is critical to your next step. And many of the higher level um, positions within the scientific community and also um, technology as well. So we're gonna start a little bit about talking about um, Carnegie Mellon University and um, what we do here and a little bit about our community. So I'm gonna try to, here we go. Okay, great. So the Summer Scholar Program is part of the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Carnegie Mellon University is a top ranked US university. We're located on the East Coast in the state of Pennsylvania in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It has one of the strongest um, computer science, machine learning, robotics, um, language technology. All of the departments within the School of Computer Science are top ranked and there are so many different research um, opportunities here. Through Carnegie Mellon, there's been a spin-off of many different robotics companies, software companies and others. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what we hope that um, the Institute represented in the past and going forward as well. It's understanding what the forefront of knowledge around robotics and what you'll hear from the scholars is the way that we define robotics is really broad. So there's a lot of different um, research and, and applications from you know really that technology ready, this level from very low to very high full commercialization as well. So 
a few thing, more things about the, the Robotics Institute that we're excited about is the strength of the research and also the strength of the education. So bottom line is that a lot has happened here. We've been on the forefront, really foundational to the growth of robotics worldwide. But what we wanna talk about today is really the Summer Scholar Program. And when I'm thinking of, and talking about the Summer Scholar Program, what I want you to think about in your mind is that there are many different undergraduate research opportunities throughout the world. There are many different programs. So we're gonna share through the lens of RIS, um, but we want you to think about at your home university, some of the very first steps to get started are project courses, working with faculty members on um, extending that course research, looking at the breadth of um, opportunities. So you have courses, you have projects, you have um, formal research as an undergraduate, you have some things that might just be coding, but it's building a series of experiences and thinking about it through the lens of what skills are you getting to um, practice and develop. And so research allows us to really engage in discovery. And at the undergraduate level, um, in many universities, research is almost inaccessible to um, undergraduate students. But with RIS and Carnegie Mellon, it's really a full immersion in research. So RIS has three parts. And I want you to think about this for any of the research opportunities you might look at. So really guided research. You're not going to be told like, you know, here are the, the steps to research. We want you to do this, this, and that. You're going to be within a research community, helping to articulate and define contributions, going through a really iterative process. So RIS is not about success or failure, but instead building those skills. And so you have the guided research around that you have professional development. So there are communication um, tutors and, and workshops. There are robotics workshops. We want you to come in and um, think about what is robotics? What's the importance of robotics? How can it be used to solve some of the world's greatest problems? And where is it being, how are they using robotics to explore um, different issues? So we want you to be exposed to a lot. And finally, and I hope this is one of the most um, impactful parts of the Summer Scholar Program is that there's really a strong community environment and that community starts with a core of the scholars themselves. Um, and last year we had 47 scholars from at least 11 different home countries, 40 different home universities. So it's so diverse, uh, people coming together and exploring and building skills together. These are your colleagues, hopefully for life, right? So RIS is global. Yeah, um, you do not need to be a US student or studying in the US to participate. Think about that as you explore opportunities and the scholars will talk about DAAD and um, RISE worldwide and the opportunity that that provides for um, German students to go out and really start to explore. So we've had students from all over the world come and um, join us for the, the program. And really um, at its core, it's about exploring research. It's about trying to um, understand um, what the pathways forwards are. So it's that core group that is throughout that, that is core to that experience. You will, as a summer scholar, and the same in many other research um, experiences, it's about growing, learning, contributing. And so you're coming in to add to um, experiences. You're coming to add to the research. You're not coming in um, having to define a whole new area, but instead adding to that and working with the community there. So RIS is really about um, launching the next generation of roboticists. Here are just a few of our graduates from the last years. Um, so many students go through the Summer Scholar Program and then are able to go on to graduate school in the US and elsewhere. So it's really a gateway about that. And we help to define some of the products and um, to help support you in your, your next step. So RIS is about that learning experience, the collaborative um, work and figuring out what pathways may be open to you. You'll be surprised with how many different research opportunities there are. And as the global science and technology field has grown, um, there's more R&D experiences and available in careers and in industry as well. So when you're thinking about graduate school, it's really a gateway to so many different things. And at the end of, the experience. RIS is an 11 week program with those three elements of 
the guided research, professional development, and the community. The output is a series of products that you're able to share um, and use to um, pursue your next steps. During the summer, um, we often have visits from industry leaders, but we also make some time for fun as well. So when you think about any of your undergraduate uh, research opportunities that might be available to you, here's one of the reasons. It really prepares you for graduate school. And in the US, um, within robotics, there are a lot of funding opportunities for um, graduate school, but you need to have undergraduate research experience. So RIS and other programs are really gateways for you to um, explore some of those programs and to um, get ready for that as well. Our students go all over the world and they um, work really at top companies. So a few essentials um, to, and at the end we'll review a couple of these. These are specific for the RI Summer Scholar Program. The applications are open right now. The same thing for the DAAD, um, RISE Worldwide Scholarships as well. Those are open. This is risk specific. Um, and we'll have a program that starts June 1st, goes through August 4th. Um, and many scholars can stay to the, until the end of August as well to continue their work. I'm gonna pause here and um, turn it over to the scholars. And at the end, we'll take some time for questions, but we'll also take some time to provide some tips on applying to the Summer Scholar Program and other research programs that might be in the US or anywhere in the world that are about building research skills so that you can explore and get ready for impact at graduate school. So I'm gonna turn it over to the scholars to share some of their experiences within RIS and elsewhere. Yeah, all right. Uh, I think I'm going to start. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, my journey of how I ended up applying to RIS because it's uh, somewhat German specific. Uh, I actually didn't apply to RIS directly, which in retrospect probably was a mistake, uh, but uh, I actually applied through RISE. Um, which is the German DAID supported um, internship exchange uh, program uh, that you can apply for every fall. And um, exactly through them, I kind of got into this position of taking part in RIS, um, which was somewhat unusual. So everything like bureaucratically took a little bit longer. That's why I'm saying it probably wasn't the best idea. It's probably the best idea to actually do what they say in the ad and apply to both. Um, but yeah, ultimately I ended up at RIS, um, to my own surprise, to be honest, I didn't think I would kind of fit that bill, but I think, um, yeah, um, they do take people from all walks of life really. And, um, yeah, I joined RIS. I, uh, did some research on, uh, tree deformation for agriculture robots under Oliver Cromer, uh, which is one of the professors at, uh, Carnegie Mellon and um, worked in his lab, which was an amazing experience. I'm honestly, um, the, it was the first time I was able to do uh, like research, um, which is what I want to do, uh, this openly and um, this uh, self-directed, uh, uh, this much, uh, with this much self-direction. And um, it it really was an amazing experience to kind of be able to take part in research that hadn't been done before. Like I think, in, um, especially in undergrad, you a lot of the time just learn what had been done before already. And especially in Germany, if you don't especially look for it, um, there's very little chance to actually do research. And um, Carnegie Mellon had this, uh, and RIS specifically is this amazing program that really allows you to do that. But I think despite all of this, um, the most uh, the, the biggest uh, gain that I took out of the project um, is really the connections that I formed and the kind of network that I was able to build because um, you have to be aware that you're not the only one taking part. There's an entire community. There's roughly like 50 people um, taking part each year, maybe 40 something. Um, and uh, you do have contacts with them. We had regular social events with them. We had uh, the opportunity to get to know them. And um, I believe that's like a really important thing because A, of course, they're like people in your field that 
want to go into that field and so they're going to be your colleagues in the future um so networking there i think is just a good idea in general but i think um i think it's especially the uh, thing that i took away is also like um comparing yourself with your peers really i think it's uh, very inspiring to see what other people are doing uh, potentially from the same country so you can just apply that to yourself be like hey why don't apply i apply to this thing or that thing and things like that and also potentially from other countries and you can see how things work there uh, you can kind of see what they have to struggle with and um it gives you a lot of uh context really to um to your own kind of path and it, it's very motivating honestly i think um before this, um, I did not really plan on applying to uh, grad school in the US, but I think Chris helped me kind of open my eyes to the uh, US system and some opportunities that are possible um, to study there, even if you don't have like the huge tuition fees that are usually required. And um, so, yeah, I think the the network and the knowledge that you can gain from that network is really worth a lot and i'm still in contact with uh some of my alums from uh, the summer and also still in contact with some of the people from my lab i actually managed to continue some of my research that i started um past the summer and um it's uh really a a great opportunity to kind of find your way into this field and network in this field and um i can only really um praise this opportunity for anybody that's interested in robotics or even just computer science in general and i think uh yeah then i'm going to pass it off to jana okay uh hi i'm jana as i mentioned before i study computer science at Karlsruhe institute of technology and i also found out about RISP because of the DAAD RISE program it's a very, very nice program and there are a bunch of internship opportunities for anyone who studies anything stem related um, and I would highly suggest checking it out and clicking through the site. They have some very interesting opportunities also in like not only in the US, also in like Jordan or some other countries. Um, but through that website, I found uh, RIS, uh, kind of complicated to keep the name straight. I found RIS through RISE uh, and I applied. I also thought I wouldn't make it because I on the website, there is like a list of things you should like past applicants or past successful applicants fulfilled. And out of this list, I fulfilled maybe half of the criteria. But I remember during one of the information sessions, like this one, another alum said, if you want to be accepted, you should apply. Like the worst thing they're going to do is reject you. But you cannot complain that you've not been accepted if you actually didn't apply. So I thought that was true. And I applied and I thought I might try, even though I'm probably not going to make it. But in the end, uh, as you can see now, I, uh, I got accepted. I was very happy. Um, and I also spent the summer in the US. And for me, the interesting or the most interesting thing was not only the research, but also how the American academic system is different from the German academic system. You might have noticed that we always talk about grad school and undergraduate. That's because the cut that I knew from like the German system, the cut between people that just study in order to go into industry and the people that study that want to do research, normally in Germany happens after the master's. And then we differentiate kind of between PhD and master. But in the US, this cut already happens after your undergrad. So after your bachelor's, and then if you go on to your master's or PhD, then you normally want to do it, then you normally want to go into research. But also what going into research meant was also totally new for me. So for example, out of my lab, most of the people I worked with, they all wanted to go into industry and do like uh, industrial research which was totally new to me because I all thought most of the time you're doing a PhD in order to go into academia and not to go and not and not um, and not because you wanted to go into industry. But it was very fun um, because we also got to visit some of the um, companies that the PhD students were later uh, would later go on to work at. For example, we visited like a um, uh, <clears throat> a company that wants to send the first commercial um robot to the moon that was very fun but we also got to visit a few other companies um for example autonomous driving companies um so that is some also a huge opportunity that we only got through RIS. <clears throat> um and even though if you don't really want to go into the american academic system which is totally fine 
I think it's still a benefit if you know about the American academic system or about any other uh, academic system, because you also get in touch with a lot of, for example, Indian uh, interns, who then you can talk with about the Indian uh, system. And I think that for me personally opened my eyes on understanding how different cultures or how different academic cultures work and to understand the, and to understand why they are different and how this difference may be better or worse, whether it may fit to me personally more or less. Um, and I think it opened my eyes and opened doors for me, or so risk opened eyes and doors for me, which I previously never knew existed. So for example, before coming to risk, I didn't knew that it was normal in the US to go from your bachelor's to your PhD directly and not do a master's in between, which is unthinkable of in, in Germany. Um, overall, I think I was very, I, I'm very thankful to have had this opportunity in order to experience all of these new things, in order to um, do a lot of great research, in or, and it was so much fun, um, in order, and also to learn about the American academic system. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Tim. All right. Lastly, you get me. Hi, I'm Tim. I already hinted at it. I am a computer science student. Full disclosure, I am not interested in robotics at all, I, I guess I could say. And <laughs> my journey kind of mirrors Jana's and Jan's. Uh, so I, I proceeded the same way. I actually uh, first applied to RISE on the German side, and then I somehow landed at RIS, and it was a great experience. So um, what I really want to hammer down on, which is also like a really German perspective, is this aspect of truly researching, which is kind of, you, you we, we said it a lot, like every, every one of us already said, oh yeah, it's a research experience. So from a German point of view, what you perceive as research is kind of th this magical thing that somehow starts after after you've completed your bachelor's degree for, for example and uh, what i realized in uh, in america that's not the case so so we came to this and suddenly it's oh by the way you're doing research now and then we actually got to do research so it, it's like you're actually working on I guess cutting edge stuff and you're really involved in what what your lab is doing so for example i was at the um at the NAF lab uh, under uh, Dr. Christoph Mertz. So um, that's also a part of, um, of the Robotics Institute. And there was a place for me in just doing computer vision, which one might not even consider pure robotics. At least it's not like a moving robot. And then as a computer science student with interest in computer science, I actually got to work on what they were working on. And they sat me down and gave me a topic and then I could just freely research. And at first that was a very overwhelming experience, especially 11 weeks don't really feel like 11 weeks when you spend the two, first two, three weeks just settling in its new country. Uh, there's a lot of not new people to, to get to know and suddenly you're really deep inside. And what I want to show off to kind of uh, give a feeling for what you can achieve, this is not meant to be a break or something. Now, give me a second. Oh, wait. Now I screwed up. Oh yeah, so here. Um, you, you have these certain key deliverables and in our case that's writing a paper and um wait and in the end having a poster about your work and what you did uh, over the summer so when you start out it really feels like oh I, I will never achieve anything and then suddenly you get to write like seven eight pages of proper research presented to your peers and suddenly it feels very serious and that I, I loved it. So I, before coming there, I, I already knew um, maybe I want to go into research. Maybe that's what I want to do. And now I'm really sure about that. And it just opened my eyes that that's actually a possibility. Whereas in Germany, you kind of ease into it through like these bogus jobs where you just really try to, to get into your professor's favors. And then oh maybe he has something for me. And then you get, get to watch from the sidelines as other people do interesting stuff. That's really not the case. And I wholeheartedly recommend it to everyone who has considered going into research and also just has considered going abroad because even if you don't want to end up in research, it's just a cool experience overall. And I think even in industry, there's research. Uh, Jana mentioned that before. Uh, lastly, the fact that we are all still here to talk about risks and are willing to, to put ourselves out there, I think speaks volumes about the, the quality of this program and how much we've enjoyed it. And I think that's it for me.
Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so we've gotten some great questions uh, um, coming in through YouTube, and I'm going to share a um, screen again with some information, and um, maybe uh, together we can answer some of those questions or or, or share our perspectives on those. Um, but uh, in the background, I'll leave this up um, because some of these the, these these links may be helpful. On the RISS, so the RISS website, you'll find the research showcase, you'll find the mentors, you're gonna find frequently asked questions as well. There's a number of questions that usually come through in each one of these sessions. And so I want to answer quickly a few of those and then share also with the team here um, so we can share different perspectives as well. So one of the questions is, what do you do? What do outcomes look like um, for the summer scholars? And Tim, I think you addressed that. There are um, deliverables of a paper, a poster, and a, a video. And across the go cohort, there'll be 40 to 50 members. You're going to approach that in many different ways. You can, on the RISC website, look at the research from the, the last few years to see what kind of projects exist. What are the labs that actively um, participate? So if I was a um, potential applicant for summer scholar program or for any research, undergraduate research program, I'm going to go to that website first. And on the RISC website, to understand the projects that may exist and the type of skills that you need, I would go to the research showcase. There are posters, videos, and papers there. I would suggest that you look at several different years of, of work and you're looking to the risk projects will be within many of those. And sometimes some newer projects will come up, but you'll see a really good snapshot of usually what is available and the kind of matching. There's a, a matching of students' backgrounds that are selected for the program with some of the projects. So sometimes there can be some changes over time. Um, Jan, Jana, uh, um, Tim, if you were a student or um, that was thinking about undergraduate research and in the case of risk, how would you look to discover some of the research projects that might be um, possible for summer scholars? Having the expertise now of being immersed and having gone through it, right? So I did exactly what you proposed, Rachel. Um, I went through the research showcase and I looked at like, um, recent um, projects that were work that they were advertised on the lab I wanted to work with. And I was like, yeah, I'm interested in working with that because of XYZ. Um, and then I got accepted to that lab as a risk student, um, which was the, um, <coughs> uh, I forgot the name, no. <laughs> uh, but I was accepted to that lab um, and I could have worked there uh, until Artur Dubrowski. Um, and then we talked about what research opportunities that were out there because for the research opportunity I expressed my interest in all of the graduate students would actually be on intern like on internships themselves so that was um, over the summer so that wouldn't fully have worked then we talked about and there was another uh, research opportunity that might have come up which I also found interesting and then out of the blue I was um, contacted contacted by a second lab who I later ended up working with who proposed a told me a new research topic, which I didn't really actually mention in my uh, statement of purpose. I only mentioned that I did some work on computer vision before, um, but I didn't actually mention that that is something that I would be interested in working because my whole statement of purpose was tailored only towards Arthur Dabrowski's lab. Um, and in the end, I took the offer from the second lab, which I'm very grateful for. So I think you have to be kind of flexible. So it is good in order to be specific and in order to in mention specific stuff because that just shows, shows that you did your homework and you actually read up on, on, on projects. But it is also fine after you've been admitted to go in and talk with your advisor and ask what are other opportunities that you might have? What are um, PhD students that would be willing to advise me that would really have fun at advising me? So it's, it's fine to be a bit flexible, but of course the overall lab should have should the majority of the topics that the lab are currently working on should fit your research interest. I think that is a good uh, rule of thumb to go by. Yeah, definitely, I have to agree. Uh, I think for me, it was slightly different. I didn't go quite the uh, supposed path, I suppose, uh, because I kind of only applied through RISE. Uh, on RISE, they do 
kind of outline what the lab is working on, but it's obviously more um, advantageous to look up the lab itself on the RIS website. Uh, but yeah, what I can really underline is how flexibility, how you should stay flexible, but also how you can still stay flexible. Because in my experience, for example, I uh, kind of got matched with my mentor and sat down with him. And then he had uh, multiple possible avenues that might have been had a connecting um, element, of course. Uh, they were all within manipulation, but the specifics were very different. And then I was able to kind of communicate what the real, like what I really find interesting and kind of pick the one that fit me the most. So uh, <clears throat> I would also encourage you to A, look for a lab, but also not be discouraged if you don't find exactly what you want. Um, which I don't know if that's even very likely because RIS does very, or uh, CMU does very uh, wide research, of course. But um, yeah, I think the, the there's always still opportunity to kind of, uh, I don't want to say always, but there's probably still an opportunity to kind of negotiate something or to kind of um, like talk to your mentor and really find something that you really uh, think fits you. I think that's really great. Tim, would you like to add to that as well? Oh, yeah. I, I would uh, like to add one last thing, uh, which was kind of my situation. If you don't know what you really want, just keep an open mind, I guess, because I was similarly, I applied through RISC, uh, through RISE exclusively. So I didn't really know what I was getting into. And quite frankly, I had no clue what my research interests were. So I just applied on a whim for uh, the first project that I saw. And it ended up working out really well. And you can get a lot done, surprisingly, if you, even if you have no like prerequisites. And it's just enthusiasm makes up for a lot of, uh, well, capabilities, I suppose. And it's just good to, to be open-minded. And maybe it, it ends up being something completely different from what you've ever considered before. For example, I have never touched computer vision in my life before get, uh, going there. And somehow it ended up working out. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to add to that. What, um, so through the, the three different experiences here, one of the things that uh, uh, points to when you're looking for any undergraduate research experience, is it that you're going to be just, are you gonna be with one lab and that team or do you have an opportunity to work in a broader community? One of the things that we feel within the Summer Scholar Program and at the Robotics Institute is that there's such value in having um, we would almost say it like multiple islands or homes. So um, as a summer scholar, the cohort is one of your homes. Your lab is your research home, but then there's this broader community as well for you to explore. When you're thinking about the undergraduate research opportunities, you're looking at that environment, you're looking at outcomes as well. And from our perspective at the, the Robotics Institute, we're trying to set this up for iterations. And so each of you came in with different experiences. And Yana, one of the things that you said, which is so important and is actually one of the criteria within the um, admissions review is looking at um, what kind of, of exploration of the current research projects have you done as an applicant? So one of the things you want to avoid doing is a dear professor letter or dear RI letter. And what I mean by that is there's gotta be some specificity. You can have um, come in with, as Tim is saying, uh, um, that, that open mind ready to explore. As Jana was saying, be flexible. And as um, Jan said, there's an opportunity even after you make that match to explore your range of background experiences and skills and the different projects that are going on. Each lab has lots of active projects. So um, the Robotics Institute is um, the, the largest academic department and world's largest um, research unit in robotics um, um, and has grown. And I know that there, there are labs and groups that are growing around the world, but we're always one of the biggest. So that, that means two things. One is that there's such a breadth of, of material and opportunities that you won't be able to explore um, all of them. And the second thing is, is that 
if you have a range of skills, you'll be able to find many places in which you could explore and experience. Coming through risk, um, you're matched with a lab and a project, but that may not be your home forever. And what I mean by that is we expect continued engagement and thinking about, you know, what are next steps? So if you come in and you're working with one lab, you might come back as a grad graduate student later on. And it's not necessarily the case that you'll stay with the same lab. We we really um, encourage um, individuals to explore different areas of robotics research. There um, were some questions about the selection criteria. There were also um, some questions, and I, and I wonder if we could kick off with, with this question. Um, who should write your letter of recommendation? Because this is something that we've discussed within um, our German uh, team, because a letter of recommendation can be very different across cultures, across academic uh, uh, um, um, units, and also academic systems. So what are your, um, uh, what's your, your advice on um, how to approach that and think about the letter of recommendation, because it could be something that's very new for someone that's either watching this video or um, listening and participating right now. I mean, um, I guess I'll take the floor first. Um, so yeah, letter of recommendation is a big thing. I mean, we've gotten some feedback that uh, especially for students from Germany, it's just uncommon to need them. And I think professors aren't necessarily used to writing them either. Uh, I personally just reached out to a professor that I thought would write a le letter of recommendation for me. And um, then they wrote it for me and luckily I was accepted. Um, but I think what we uh, kind of were told and learned during RIS as well is that there, in the US there's a much bigger culture for these kinds of letters of recommendation. And there are, th are some things uh, to look out for. Uh, for example, a lot of these letters of recommendations, uh, especially also later for grad school, are supposed to kind of show your ability to do research. So it's very advantageous if you find somebody, if you happen to have done project work or research with a professor or with faculty. Um, there is a um, Th that would be the person to ask because um, that's really what those letters are supposed to showcase. They're supposed to showcase your ability to work on a research project. Um, if you don't have something like that, I mean, you can obviously reach out to another professor. Uh, I think for RISE, there was a recommend uh, there was a requirement that the letter of recommendation came from a faculty member, so a professor. Uh, but I heard in the U.S. sometimes you might also get a letter, letter of recommendation from a um, workplace or perhaps a person in the university that's not necessarily a professor, uh, but that you've worked with. And that obviously, I mean, you couldn't ask like a fellow student, that's clear, but um, or that would be very unlikely. Uh, but um, I think that kind of the primary goal should be to find somebody who can really speak on your research experience and your, on your ability to do research. That's great. Um, Jan or Jana, or sorry, Jana or, or Tim, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that I think um, RIS is doing an amazing job at actually taking into consideration all those cultural differences um, and actually taking the extra, extra step in order to understand letters of recommendation if they come from different cultures. I remember, for example, John Dolan once said that he knows that um, English letters of recommendation are just totally different from American letters of recommendation. And if an English letter of recommendation says someone is good, it's actually an American fantastic and over the top. Um, so I think that oh, no, it doesn't really, I mean, of course it matters who you choose, is, but you, you shouldn't really think about the cultural difference because that is being taken care of by risk. They actually go that extra step and it's actually pretty easy because there were so many different applicants from so many from such a diverse group of countries and the faculty is also so diverse that it actually makes it very easy to take all of those things into consideration that's um the that was one of the things i wanted to say and uh the other thing is i think the letter of recommendation you should you shouldn't worry too much about it. Of course, it's one major part of your application, but you still have the opportunity through the statement of purpose to frame yourself what you want to portray and 
what your research interests are. So I think it's only one part of your application. You shouldn't worry too much. I want to add a little thing to, uh, to Jan's point uh, earlier. Uh, maybe you don't actually have done research or any great projects or something like that. Once again, German view, that's quite common that you don't really do big things in, in undergrad degrees. Um, I think the most important thing is that you have some kind of personal connection because it's trivially easy to get a professor to write you a, a did well in class letter and it's just oh wait wait i just look up his grade and it's a it's an a grade and then you can read the letter and it, it looks great but it doesn't say anything and so if, if you have any professor you where you have some kind of connection and they remember you i think that's already better than just a they achieved an a in my class but i didn't remember them better yeah <clears throat> but I think one thing that I might want to, uh, one tip I might want to give at the very end, uh, for me personally, when I was faced with the task of getting a letter of recommendation, because it's so unusual, I was never in the position to ask for one. I didn't know who to ask. It was a very daunting task. And I personally asked a professor that did not necessarily know about my research previously and uh, that I think didn't know me well personally. So uh, exactly the kind of letter that we would tell you not to aim for. But even with that letter I managed to get here, um, I think before you get too intimidated by asking for one of these letters and then decide not to apply at all, any letter of recommendation is better than no letter of recommendation really. So that might be my final point that I wanted to give is like, it's important, but do not be too intimidated by it. Oh, I also have one final <laughs> tip. Um, and that is, if you have a professor who vaguely knows you, um, just type down how they know you, what you did, your achievements, maybe attach a CV when you ask for the letter of recommendation, just so they have things they can actually write about. And even if you only have a, that person was good in class letter, you can even turn that into a very great letter of recommendation if, if those letters are specific, if they specifically say what you did good, how you um, excelled the class requirements, but the professor is probably not going to remember that just because the classes are so enormous. So just remind uh, he or she of that, and then they can also include that in their letter and everything's fine. One of the things that I'm reflecting on as we're, 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 we're in this discussion is that, you know, as you approach applying for the Summer Scholar, there's a lot of nuances, there's different pieces. And Yana, as you were saying, within the admissions committee, um, there's a broad range of backgrounds and expertise. And we're going in with the lens that uh, people are coming from different academic systems and uh, may or may not have experience um, in uh, applying for these types of programs or have access to robotics research or um, know the type of, of letters that are really expected within these, these, these environments. So that's where RIS is really about truly opening doors and looking um, at a range of backgrounds and looking at the opportunity that, that we as a community can provide. When you come through RIS and hopefully now both, you know, um, the, 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 the scholars will feel much more grounded in what do I need to write for um, a statement of purpose, for a letter, what kind of letter of recommendation do I need for grad school? And that's part of the risk experience as well. So you're coming in, we understand everyone's coming in with different um, level of technical skills, professional skills, but also savvy or exposure to these other things as well. So um, letters of recommendation are best from faculty rather than industry usually when I go through and, and, and read those, those letters. So we suggest that. And as Yana, as you were saying, um, provide um, some background details to the letter writer so they can write the let best re letter possible um, for you. There were a few more um, questions that are coming in and, and I know that we're, we're getting a little bit short on time. So we'll have about five minutes to um, wrap up. There's a couple that I'll just um, answer quickly. One is about the student profile. To participate in the Summer Scholar Program, you must be an undergraduate student and you must have at least one semester, for preferably two, after the Summer Scholar Program. So that means that Summer Scholar Program 
um, um, ends in August, that you would have a fall semester and probably a spring semester as well. So the Summer Scholar, um, the profile is not for a graduating um, senior student. Um, what kinds of projects? Uh, we touched upon that with um, and within the Summer Scholar uh, website, you'll see a link to the posters, videos, and papers. Start with um, probably the posters and the videos. Look there first. That's easier to kind of explore through. I really like the um, strategy that Yana um, had shared about being very specific and showing an interest there, but also being open as Jan and Tim were saying about, this is about that exploration, but showing some matching. And what that does is it shows I have this skill set and I may be able to contribute it here. Um, there is one admissions deadline. So that is January 15th. Um, and um, there's some questions about is it, you know, is there is admissions rolling? How does that work? I would apply early. I would definitely apply, you know, at least five or, or, or 10 days before the deadline because we're, we're going in there, we're reviewing and we're setting up some um, uh, of, of the admissions committee and such. And you don't want to be in a situation where um, something happened with the internet or you couldn't get a letter of recommendation. One of the things that we what we find from the from applicants is that the biggest hurdle may be they're not able to get that letter of recommendation in time. And if you don't have it, then you can't be considered for um, placement. Selection, however, is, um, I wouldn't call it rolling. It opens up at the same time, but there are multiple conversations. Um, as each of the scholars said, is that there's a conversation about the possibilities and how to navigate and, and, and such. And so it's not just a oh, okay, they applied, they really like these three labs and check and they're gonna do this project. It's more of a conversation and that's what um, graduate school is like in higher education. So it's, it's, it's part of that process as well. So um, I am going to turn it back to the scholars with um, a question and then we'll, we'll see what other questions might come in. Can you talk about one of the things that maybe as an undergraduate, I don't remember placing the focus on this or understanding the importance. And I think each of you have um, really pro provided tremendous insight into this. What is the power and importance of the network and community? So as they're approaching any undergraduate research experience or industry and think about that lens, you know, um, what, you know, what, um, what was the impact of the, the RI community for you and the larger community? And what would you tell yourself to look for now that you've experienced something like that? What would you tell? I'll turn that over to the scholar. Well, I, I guess you're definitely not alone in the in the projects that you are doing. So, so at first, you obviously you apply for yourself, and it's your project that you end up doing, which you work on alone. But that's really only a really small part of the whole experience. First of all, you have a, a network in in your mentors, in the the people in your lab, like that. That's that's huge. I, I didn't expect them to actually like interact with me. <laughs> I guess I, I was that that weird intern, and but they did just. Uh, took me in and I, we had great conversations and they taught me a lot and then also obviously you have this whole social aspect of it so we were like 50 people all similar ages similar stages in their life and that just makes a huge difference to how you approach the, the whole experience obviously you can just bury yourself and work but it was just a process of learning together and kind of exchanging experiences and that made it so much better than it could have been like if, if there wasn't such a network. Yeah, I think for me, the community really did uh, three things. Uh, first, I think it's uh, it gave me, like it helped me learn things. As Tim mentioned, uh, you have support from your mentors, support from the other people in the lab. And there's so much knowledge there and they can help you kind of understand things. And that's really amazing. Um, but the other two things that that allowed me is like, first of make connections to in the future potentially work together like i have after i left RIS, i continued working at my research project and uh, we actually uh, submitted a paper to icra which is a research conference uh, based on that uh, we haven't been accepted yet um, <clears throat> but um, basically uh, so that's an avenue that i think we should be aware of is that it opens doors for you uh, it gives you the opportunity to um 
like continue working with them uh, if you want to. And um, that's, I think, a great opportunity. And the third thing really uh, is that it uh, allows you to kind of uh, give, get yourself context, I think, uh, kind of open your eyes and inform yourself not about the topics of the of like robotics or computer science, but of like how the education system works. Uh, because in my case, for example, there were a lot of people that I interacted with that had way more knowledge about how that how every step works than me. And RIS does explicitly helps you with that, but also just conversation with uh, other people in that uh, field helps a lot to kind of realize opportunities that are basically just waiting for you to go for them and uh, that I would have otherwise missed simply because I didn't know about them. So I think those three things are really the main takeaways for me personally. Of course, I totally agree with what Jan and Tim just said, but just taking it into the perspective of what I would have looked for, um, I would have definitely looked for a community that's supportive, that actually cares about you, that doesn't see you as an intern who just does the dirty work, but actually cares about you progressing. And I think I totally found that community at risk. It was totally fine. Like my research project didn't work out in the end. And that's totally fine because it was all about the exploration and about taking going on this journey together. And it was super, it was such an amazing experience, even though I didn't submit a paper, sadly. <laughs> um, I would definitely look for that. Um, and I think that's the main the main thing I would look for is that they actually care about you as a person and not you as a workforce. Tim, is there anything that you'd like to add or, or, or any other comments there? I think it's been so beautifully said. So a couple things to, to wrap up um, for us today. And um, Jana, I'm gonna um, uh, hearken back to what you said earlier, which one of the scholars said last year, apply apply to multiple programs, explore, see what opportunities are there. Uh, um, they're waiting for you, Ayana, as you were saying, to apply, to seize them. And there is a lens of, you know, what um, types of backgrounds, what types of opportunities have you already been exposed to? And so coming in, share what you've done and also make sure that you've done that, that exploration of what the projects at the Robotics Institute and within the risk community uh, um, is. We really want to support the scholars. We wanna help them with next steps. Um, there will be more um, um, online information sessions uh, throughout the fall. And in the different information sessions, we're gonna explore from different avenues or lenses. So in some of the upcoming sessions, we're gonna specifically focus on various labs. And so they're gonna present more of their research and, and, and some of those topics as well to give you insight to that. One of the things that the Robotics Institute is absolutely committed to is we have tremendous people and, and resources here working to explore so many different aspects of robotics. We want to give and, and share that with um, more scholars and emerging scholars around the world. So we have seminar series that are open. We'll do information sessions. We're trying to find ways to share and to give you insights into some of the topic areas here. So we hope that you'll join us for future sessions. The best way to become um, um, notified is to subscribe to the YouTube channel and we'll have those listed as those are um, set up. Within the Robotics Institute, many of the presenters, you'll see whether they're graduate students or um, um, or that are currently at the Institute or RIS alums, they're all RIS alums. There was our very first um, session about applying to grad school from RI um, was earlier in the day and all of the scholar, all of the students presenting were RIS alums. So it's a tremendous community. We hope that you will explore this and many other opportunities across the world, um, keeping the um, DAAD rise and RIS uh, um, a, 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 a separate and understanding apply to both. There are opportunities. If you're a German student watching this, there are tremendous opportunities and we hope that you will um, see some of those opportunities. So we look forward to um, connecting again and um, thank you for uh, joining us today. Take care everyone and um, we're gonna wrap up now. <laughs>